Hi, thanks for stopping by again today. I've got a story I'd like to tell you today about this man right here. We'll get the uh, glare off of it there, but uh, in order to understand this man, we're going to actually start with a quote, and this is out of the Bible Dictionary, and if you look in the Bible Dictionary under the heading Bibles, comma, English, you'll read the following quotation. In 1537, Thomas Matthew, whose real name was John Rogers, issued, also with the king's license, an addition that followed Tinsdale's as regards the New Testament and half the Old Testament, the remainder being taken from Coverdale's. A copy of this Bible was ordered by Henry VIII to be set up in churches. So this man, Thomas Matthew, whose real name was the Reverend John Rogers, actually is credited with producing the first complete English language Bible. And I think that's pretty cool. Now, what is also really cool is Thomas Matthew, also known as Reverend John Rogers, is my 12th great-grandfather. And in order to understand uh, the contribution that uh, Grandpa Rogers made, uh, we're going to go back and we're going to start in the 1500s. Back then, it was illegal to translate the scriptures into English. It was even illegal to own or to read an English Bible. To defy these laws could mean imprisonment, inquisition, torture, or death by burning alive at the public stake. Nevertheless, in the face of such danger and persecution, God moved upon three men. One of them, William Tinsdale, the other, John Rogers, and the other, Miles Coverdale. And these three were interconnected in bringing about the English version of the Old and the New Testament together to make a complete Bible. So, Grandfather Rogers was born about 1500, uh, some say 1500, I've seen others at 1505, uh, near what is now the city of Birmingham in England. Um, it's been said, though, that the, uh, the location had little to do with the man, and that the first 30 years of his life could be summed up in just a few words. He was educated at Cambridge, where he took a degree of Bachelor of Arts in 1525. And that's about the extent of what we know. Uh, know a little bit about his parents and uh, some, and we know that he was married, and we'll get to that here in a bit. But in order to understand Grandfather Rogers, we're actually going to start with William Tyndale. England wasn't safe for a Bible translator, so William Tyndale worked in exile in places on the European continent. There, with great difficulty and poverty, he began the work of translating the New Testament from Greek into English. He had said throughout his life that he believed God had called him to do this work and to do this translation. He was a very learned man. He loved God's word, and he was fluent in many languages to include Greek, Spanish, German, Dutch, Latin, and Hebrew. And in translating the New Testament, Tyndale worked mostly alone using the Greek, Greek scriptures that he compared and compiled from original manuscripts by the Dutch scholar Erasmus. Uh, he also used another, a lot of other resources to include dictionaries, grammars, and Martin Luther's German translation of the Bible. Um, his New Testament was first published in 1526, and his little Bibles, so small that they could fit in the palm of your hand, were smuggled into England in bales of cotton, where it says people were hungry for the truth, and bought those Bibles at great personal risk. Well, Tyndale was uh, betrayed by his enemies and was captured. And after his betrayal, he was uh, imprisoned for about 18 months. And finally, in 1536, he was condemned for heresy, heresy and was uh, had the term degraded, which means he was stripped of the priesthood in the Roman Catholic Church. He was publicly strangled, and then his body was burned 
um, at the stake. And my computer just shut down, so we're going to pop this back up there. Excuse me for that. Um, yeah, so he was burned to the stake. Um, so William Tyndale gave his life for English people and in order to give them the word of God. Okay, now, Tyndale had a very good friend in John Rogers. And in fact, it was Tyndale who convinced John Rogers that he should um, leave the Catholic Church, uh, which he did. And it was actually John Rogers that took possessions of all took possession of all of Tyndale's uh, manuscripts uh, once he was in jail. Um, Tyndale met Grandpa Rogers while they were working in Antwerp, Belgium, and uh, Rogers set out to publish a complete Bible of both the Old and the New Testament. Uh, to make up what uh, Tyndale had not been able to complete, he used the Old Testament and apocryphal translations of Miles Coverdale. And on top of that, he added a lengthy, uh, it's called a Table of Principal Matters, matters which was basically a summary of basic doctrines that were found in the Bible. And he based that on the 1535 French version of the Bible by Olivetan and added a lot of other helps uh, for people uh, to help them in their study of the Bible. Um, and so it became a colossal job of compiling, editing, and organizing. Um, Rogers finally published the complete work under the name of Thomas Matthew in 1537. And it became quickly known as the Matthew Bible or Matthew's Version. And as a gift, my wife actually got me a copy of the Matthews Bible. This is a reproduction of the 1537 edition of that Bible. And I have to tell you, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive um, because it even includes uh, a lot of the uh, woodcuts, uh, the, the pictures there. Uh, this is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And what I find interesting is it is in... Uh, Old English, and as you might be able to read this, it says the first book of Moses called Genesis, and um, it has been quite delightful to, to go through and, and read some of this. Um, I should point out on the cover here, this is a picture of William Tyndale in prison handing over his manuscripts to a guard uh, so that he can take them to John Rogers. And this uh, is a copy of the original is hanging in a museum in England. Um, but I just thought that was, uh, that was pretty cool there on that. All right, so what do we have then? Let me turn the page. What we can say is that the Matthews Bible was intended for very serious study. Um, it had a collection of biblical passages constituting an exhortation to the study of the Holy Scriptures. And the initials J.R. appeared at the end of that, knowing that it was from uh, John Rogers and it was done in his hand. Uh, the Matthews Bible contained a summary of Bible doctrine that was adapted uh, from uh, Lefebvre's French Bible of 1534, an alphabetic, uh, alphabetic concordance of Bible subjects, which were taken from uh, Olivetan's uh, 1535 French Bible. And it also had over 2,000 marginal expl explanatory notes, as well as cross-references. Cross so this was a complete English Bible for the first time in the English language, now available in England. And as the Bible Dictionary pointed out, this was done at the request of King Henry VIII, who wanted to get uh, the, the English Bible out to people. Uh, it was no longer illegal. And uh, many people who were hungry for uh, studying the, the Word of God, it was made available to them. And uh, as, as it said there... Um, Henry VIII wanted it to be set up in every church uh, throughout England. So um, quite an accomplishment. 
The story doesn't end there, though, but I'm going to end it here for today. And next time, we're going to talk about what were the consequences and what happened after um, this Bible was now published and made available to the people. So thanks for stopping by. We'll see you again next time.